Um, in just a moment, I'm going to turn the mic over to um, Lydia, our um, Trius writer for this semester, who's nearing the end of her time uh, with us on campus in residence, and I know her students have had a really special semester with her. I can see it in the back, they're like, yeah, special. Um, right? Is that, was that? No. Um, special, but not in the weird tone of voice that I used to say special. Um, so, uh, tonight's reader is the last in our series this semester, but not the last um, this year. So there'll be one more visiting writer, Lance Olson, who's going to be coming on March 10th in the spring. Um, and that's going to be a terrific reading, one you should keep an eye on. But that's far from the only offering that we have this semester, uh, in the spring semester. The spring is just going to be abundant. Um, because your faculty members are writing books like crazy. And I don't know, have any of you guys ever been to a book launch? Have you guys ever been to a book launch? So it's like a party for a book. It's like a birthday party for a book. And we're going to have two versions of those this spring um, because um, Professor Dave Weiss is going to do a reading um, with um, his friend and, um, uh, the, and Hobart alum, um, Stephen Kuzisto. And um, Catherine Coles is going to have her book launch this spring. I know, right? It's going to be the best. I don't know if you guys have seen some of their work out there, but it's amazing stuff. And our own Taylor Borby is also going to have a reading. Um, and it seems like with those four readings, we could hardly fit other things in but we will. We will. So it's going to be a semester rich and abundant with incredible literature and offerings. Um, uh, and I can't think of a more fitting introduction to the spring that lies ahead of us than tonight's reading, um, which I know many of you have had the opportunity to read tonight's visitor's work. Um, but Therese Mayo's book, Heartberries, which is a New York Times best-selling book, um, is also available for sale in the back of the room. Um, and I encourage you to pick up a copy. And as ever, you have the opportunity to get it signed after the reading. So without further ado, thank you again for coming tonight. And I turn the mic over to Lydia Yuvnovich. Hello, it's me again. Um, I still love you, squad, a lot, <laughs> uh, and I love you so much, you're going to help me make that announcement, so if you would like to hear from the Trias squad writers, we will be holding a reading on December 12th at 6 p.m. in the Fisher Center, is this right? And, and pizza <laughs> will be there. Uh, and I'm thrilled to kind of help host them. And I've enjoyed working with them all term in an orgasmic way, but nothing creepy. Just really exciting <laughs> writing risks on the page. And so thank you guys for letting me hang out with you this term. We've got like one class left, so whoa. <laughs> Love you. Love you. <laughs> Meanwhile, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read a kind of traditional version of uh, an introduction for those of you who are coming new to Teresa's work, and then I'm gonna move more toward Teresa's um, own words, and then I'm gonna end with my traditional slightly inappropriate love letter. <laughs> To this person who is just so important to me on the page and in life. So I shall embarrass her shamelessly in a second. But first, um, Therese Maya is from the Seabird Island Band, and if you don't know what that is, you should definitely look it up so that you can uh, receive an education that you went and got yourself. 
She's the New York Times bestselling author of Heartberries, which some of us in the room have read, and if you haven't read it, go get it tonight. Uh, her book was a finalist for the Governor's General Literary Award for English Language Nonfiction. It was selected by Emma Watson as the Our Shared Shelf Book Club pick for March and April. Heartberries was also listed as an NPR Best Book of the Year, a Library Journal Best Book of the Year, a New York Public Library Best Book of the Year. Are you sensing a motif? a Chicago Public Library Best Book of the Year, and was one of Harper Bazaar's Best Books of 2018. Are there more of them? Is that correct? Yeah, I think more has happened since then. Yeah, it's badass. She's the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award, the Electra Quinney Award for Published Stories, a Clara Johnson Award, and also the recipient of the Spalding Prize for the Promotion of Peace and Justice in Literature, which is personally meaningful to me. I think there's more words, too, <laughs> since then. And she teaches creative writing right now at Purdue University. So that's the kind of traditional, and it's, it doesn't even have all the shit in it. It's just amazing what the last two years have uh, carried for this amazing writer and friend. So, you know NPR? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've heard of NPR. Yeah, see? <laughs> so there's a woman on NPR that does a show called Weekend Edition, and she interviewed Therese, and her name's Lulu Garcia Navarro. Anybody? Right? And I love her. She's great. I've talked to her too. I, I love her. And she called Heartberries um, an indigenous woman's chaotic coming of age story. And so that was interesting to me. And then she said this other interesting thing. Therese started her new memoir, Heartberries, while she was in an institution where she had committed herself after a breakdown. The pages bleed with the pain of mental illness, lost love, and her family history on an Indian reservation in British Columbia. Um, I love Lulu. No shade on Lulu, okay? You hear me? Um, but that, that narrative sets the story up to fit into a certain trope of women writing about pain. And so when I read that kind of summary of Teresa's work, partly because I'm me and there's something not quite right, <laughs> but partly because I also write inside difficult material, it feels small and it feels um, like it's being inscribed in a way that makes me itchy. <laughs> And so, how I'm addressing that is I want to give you some of Teresa's words about her writing that don't do that. And if you want to look it up, I would, I would suggest, um, I guess it's an essay, Native American Lives Are Tragic, but probably not in the way you think, right? So it's the title of it. And where is it? Mother Jones. Mother Jones. Um, you can look it up yourself. But in that essay, there's a couple of excerpts I just want to set up to show you the difference between what somebody else says about this writing versus what Therese experiences writing it. Are you still with me? Yeah. Awesome. No matter what we write, white people can turn our stories into weapons, an excuse to be paternalistic. If we depict ourselves as educated and self-sufficient, they might advance the narrative that our tragedies are long past that we should dust ourselves off and move on. If we are portrayed as poor or dysfunctional or prone to alcoholism, they can use that to take away services or argue that we game the system. No matter what we do, we're still Indian, and often we don't get to speak for ourselves. You get that idea? You see, what she's, you see how that's different than the Lulu quote? Still love the Lulu. <laughs> She goes on, I resist an identity fixed in grief, but I welcome tragedy. To me, the word is pregnant with meaning. I don't mean a tragic life in which there is a magnitude to my character, my loss, and it is all towards some end, a denouement. I like the joy that's earned 
because what good is it without the threat it can be taken away? The symmetry of the Salish artwork I grew up around beckons me to consider the whole story. What I would say about Teresa's work is that her writing fucking cracks open the world. And I have a whole squad that might agree with me, back me up on that. Her writing holds binaries open long enough for truth and heart and guts to emerge without apology. Her writing is a body refusing to be silenced or cleaned up or made smaller. Her writing gives witness and voice to experiences against the grain of dominant cultures. And stunningly, her writing retrieves lost women and men and holds them and respects them and even dares to love them as if writing could do that. Even after they've gone missing, or while they are drowning in addiction or anger or pain, or even after they're dead, her writing will hold them. Her writing refuses to erase people the way dominant cultures erase people. So when I say that I love Therese Mayet's writing, I mean that I consider her to be one of the greatest living writers of our time. I mean that her writing happens to you. I also consider it an honor to be her friend and writing wing woman on occasion. So it is now with my great pleasure and a little bit of weird desire to introduce to you the brilliant writer with truth as an aesthetic, Therese Myatt, who, among other amazing things, speaks for herself. All right. She does that every time. <laughs> she makes writers cry before they have to read. It's kind of vicious. <laughs> All right, so I guess I can't, I can't read shorter than the introduction. I know that. Um, so I guess I'll start with, um, there's a few passages. I'll kind of jump around so you get the whole experience. There's what I think are the real beginnings of the book, which I did write it in the hospital. They gave me a composition book and like a pen that you can't stab yourself with, which is like just the, the ink and it's like plastic and you can bend it. And uh, let me just find it. It's in, I think it's in Indian Sick. And this is, um, this is where I come home and I still have the composition book. And the majority of that, Indian Sick, uh, I wrote in the hospital, and then the rest of it was like part email to Casey and part um, in the composition book. All right, let's see, and I'll read. I'll read from, all right, from page 45. I have been released, but I am not better. I can't work, and I won't leave the house. Outpatient treatment, because I am not crazy enough to be sedated in a madhouse. They think I'm better. I'm a cat in heat, and it's something my mother would say. I am unraveling. In a dark kitchen, I am scattering my wet eyes looking for signs of something significant. I am incorrigible when I'm like this. That's what they say. I wish I could do anything but stand alone in a dark kitchen without you. Every Christmas after my grandmother died, my mother locked herself in a room to cry. We always stood on the other side of her door looking at each other as if she might never stop crying. Some years she didn't come out until the morning. Some years she came out with red eyes and she could barely speak. 
She'd motion to get the presents from under the tree. We passed them around, and I can't remember a single present I ever received. I lock myself away as she does. Some things seem too perfectly awful. I only have crude things to say to you. I won't fuck you anymore so it can mean less. I might be gone, but you can still see me with a black light in your mattress. There's permeance in physical craft. Laura isn't absorbed in any beds. She barely perspires. She requires 24 hours protection from her own scent. She keeps her bra on. She wears practical clothes. Her fleece and cargo pants that smell of non-scented goat's milk lotion for dry skin. I use that now, it's so ironic. Um, that must do something for you. <laughs> and it does. Um, <laughs> my body left resonance that can't be dismantled or erased. I don't know if men think about what seduction is. It was reading the work you love and buying clothes and making polite conversation with your friends, convincing your mother that I could love you like she does. It was laying warm towels across my legs before I shaved so that when you touched me I was soft. It was withholding from you at the right times and listening to you with my eyes and ears. I worked hard to assert intent on you. I prepare myself for you as if I wasn't working as a server, going to college, or raising Isaiah. The weight and dust of me are in every thread of your mattress. Love is tactile learning always, first and foremost. When you loved me, it was degrading. Using me for love degraded me worse. You should have just fucked me. It was degenerative. You inside, out, then leave, then I come back, get fucked. You look down at me and say I love you. And root against me like a pig. I go home and degenerate alone. The distinctiveness of my bed and its corners are fucked by me fucking you. My agency is degraded for comfort. I remember my hospital bed and the neutrality of the room. I was safe from myself and you. I'm stupid, waiting for the phone to ring, thinking you might call. I want my grandmother's eyes on me. I thought unseeing would be a cruel game to play with myself, but now I am reading the dark and knowing how my feet drag on every inch, feeling monstrous and tired. I'd like to have familiarity back, but all I see now is my father's body over my mother, whose body is boneless like a rabbit's. I've descended into my earliest memory. It is too horrible to know, and no work of unseeing will remove him from me or turn the lights on in the room. How could someone like you ever be on the other side of the door, on the other side of all this? All right, and that's the end of Indian Sick. Uh, and I guess I'll read from Thunder Being Honey Bear, which is, at this point, the person I'm, like, the object of my affection, the, like, the epistolary work, the letter I'm writing to Casey, at this point we've fixed things and became, like, a family, and I'm pregnant, and I'm doing grad school, too. Or I just had Casey, baby Casey. Um... And this is where I kind of descend into a deeper memory of my father. Thunder being honey bear. I avoid the mysticism of my culture. People know there is a true mechanism that runs through us. Stars were people in our continuum. Mountains were stories before they were mountains. Things were created by story. The words were conjures, and ideas were our mothers. Thunder is contrary. Thunder can intuit, and her action is in music caused by lightning. She comes because we ask, and that's why falling apart is holy. People said I came from thunder. I thought the quick chaos was my master. 
My dreams were about a spinning wheel, symbols of an unstoppable force that would ruin me. I was a child when I told my mother there was a large wheel in my dreams. She asked me what I did when I saw it. I watched it, I said. She looked at me carefully that day. She took out her paints and drew a thunderbird on a white poster board. Before the paint dried, I put my finger on his blue chest. When I got my period, she gave me a Waterford crystal heart. I wore it like my brother wore his medicine bundle, around the neck and under the shirt. It felt like a new organ. In a coffee shop, I couldn't catch my breath and doubled over with pain. I remembered a man in the shower. I went outside. Closing my eyes only disoriented me further from the world, and holding on to things made me feel too connected. I called Casey. I wondered if he thought this was a real emergency or another dramatic thing. I'm constantly in some panic or despair, it seems. I worried more than I could breathe. What do I do with my hands, I thought. What do I do with my eyes, which felt obscene in the light? Thunder can awaken one's soul, even the atheist without. We have clowns in my culture who carry a subversive nature. When women wail or when they won't speak, a clown will throw its snot or contort its body to point to how absurd our pain is or how pointless it is to try to contain it. That contrary nature can awaken the dead. I thought about my mother's body weak, my father's body jaundice. I can smell him. I covered my nostrils. I remembered showering with my father more than once, and I remembered my fear of breathing. I had a new knowledge or memory and knew to be ashamed. The truth sometimes doesn't appear exact, but approximate. I knew my own fingers and my father's were shameful. I remembered in the coffee shop something so brief and kinetic that I didn't want to be in my body. Things connect with the right conduit. One right memory had been absent. As a child, I had drawn in my journal a male figure naked. My mother was shocked, so I told her a friend had drawn it. I was forbidden from going to the girl's house again, and my mother explained to me that men hurt ch children. They're capable. What Michelle drew, she said, was not right. She called Michelle's parents, and I remember thinking how right the drawing was, how I scaled each limb and part well enough that the girl next to the man appeared small, and her smile was not real, but a sign. My mother, she believed my lie easily, without question, not one. Thunder being made me feel like I had forgotten 10,000 irons plugged in. I couldn't go home. I couldn't let things burn while I looked at my hands. My husband held my shoulders. A graduate student approached us and ignored my eyes. I felt more present than I had ever been and invisible. It was Thunder Being's game or a gift of memory. This was more than simple traumatic stress or me open and gawking at my own misery. I was the third generation of the things we didn't talk about. Casey and I went to the car. Do you want a margarita, he asked. He always offers me margaritas. Um, my husband, 6'4", large head, large blue eyes, hapless and already acclimated to the chaos of me, my calls, my anxiety, and the idea that I might never be okay were acceptable by now, unusual. It's okay not to be okay, a mentor had said to me once. I held the armrest of the car, looking outside like a child, waiting for my body to feel organic again, like when I'm teaching, bouncing around the room with an agenda. At 32, I was a child, victim of something. I was afraid of what that meant, afraid I might remember clearly what happened. I made a life out of naming things, and I couldn't speak this. 
I need to see someone about this, I said. All right, and that's kind of like the midsection of Thunder Bee, Honey Bear. And then I'll read the first chapter, Indian Condition. There's this writer, Daryl McLeod, and he's Cree, and I think we're related, but that's kind of how natives are, and we all think we're related somehow, maybe. But he was talking about how, because has everyone heard about what residential school is, or Indian boarding school? Um, so, you know, in his time and in mine, like, our parents and grandparents went to Indian boarding school or residential school, whereas children, they ap they're apprehended or their parents are manipulated and convinced into letting their children go um, to boarding schools with nuns and priests until they're about 18 years old and then they're let back in the community, but they can't speak their language in those buildings and they're often beaten and there was a lot of sexual violence in that. But he was talking about how even today, our storytelling is kind of looking back at how we used to tell stories, and it's, it is cyclical, even though that's a trope now in Native Lit. But like, this story is very cyclical in that um, the book begins with Indian condition, and then the final chapter is Indian condition as well. Um, my story was maltreated. The words were too wrong and ugly to speak. I tried to tell someone my story, but he thought it was a hustle. He marked it as solicitation. The man took me shopping with his pity. I was silenced by charity. Like so many Indians, I kept my hand out. My story became the hustle. Women asked me what my envy was, and I hadn't thought about it. I considered marrying one of the men and sitting with my winnings, but I was too smart to sit. I took their money and went to school. I was hungry and took more. When I gained the faculty to speak my story, I realized I had given men too much. The thing about women from the river is that our currents are endless. We sometimes outrun ourselves. I stopped answering men's questions or their calls. Women asked me for my story, let me tell you. My grandmother told me about Jesus. We knelt to pray. She told me to close my eyes. It was the only thing she asked me to do properly. She had conviction, but she also taught me to be mindless. We started recipes and lost track. We forgot ingredients. Our cakes never rose. We started an apple head doll. The shrunken carved head sat on a bookshelf years after she left. When she died, nobody noticed me. Indian girls can be forgotten so well that they forget themselves. My mother brought healers to our home, and I thought she was trying to exercise me, a little ghost. Psychics came. Our house was ruptured. I started to craft ideas. I wrapped myself in a Pendleton blanket and picked blueberries. I pretended I was ancient. A healer looked at me, Isidore Tom. He was tall, and his jeans were dirty. He knelt down, and I thought I had been in trouble, so I told him I had been good. He said, you don't need to be nice anymore. My mother said that's when I became trouble. That's when my nightmares came. A spinning wheel, a white porcelain tooth, a snarling mouth, and lightning haunted me. My mother said they were visions. Turn your shirt backward to confuse the ghost, she said, and sent me to bed. My mother insisted I embrace my power. On the first day of school, I bound myself a small book. The teacher complimented my vocabulary, and my mother said, school's a choice. She fed me traditional food, and I went to bed early every night, but I never slept well. I fell ill with tuberculosis. Mother brought back healers. I told them my grandmother was speaking to me. Zohar, a fraud, a white mystic, a terror reader, told me she spoke to spirits too. Your grandmother says she misses you. We can never make a cake, I said. She was just telling me that. What ingredients did you forget? I knew this was a test, but a strange one, because she didn't speak to my grandmother. I remember my mom was watching us holding her breath. Eggs, I said. 
My spiritual fraud distanced me from my grandmother's spirit. It became harder to stomach myself and harder to eat. I asked Zohar, does this happen to you? What, she said. Do you ever want to stop eating? No, she said. Zohar asked my mother if she could sleep next to my bed on the floor. She listened to me all night storytelling, what potential there was in being awful. My mindlessness became a gift. I didn't feel compelled to tell any moral tales or ancient ones. I learned how story was always meant to be for Indian women, immediate and necessary and fearless like all good lies. My story was maltreated. I was a teenager when I got married. I wanted a safe home. We ruined each other, and then my mother died. I had to leave my reservation. I had to get my GED. I left my home because welfare made me choose between necessities. I used to check in some cash I saved for a ticket away and knew I would arrive with a deficit. That's when I started to illustrate my story and when it became a means of survival. The ugly truth is that I lost my son Isidore in court, the hate convention. The ugly of that truth is that I gave birth to my second son as I was losing my first. My court date and my delivery date aligned. In the hospital, they told me that my first son would go with his father. What about this boy, I said, with Isaiah in my arms. They don't seem interested yet. I brought Isaiah home from the hospital and packed Isidore's bags. Mac's husband took him along with police escorts. Before they left, I asked Vito if he wanted to hold his new baby. I don't know why I offered, but he didn't kiss our baby or tell him goodbye. He didn't say he was sorry or that it was unfortunate. Who wants one boy and not another? It's too ugly to speak this story. It sounds like a beggar. How could misfortune follow me so well, and why did I choose it every time? I learned how to make a honey reduction of the ugly sentences, and still my voice cracks. I packed my baby, and I left my reservation. I came from the mountains to an infinite and flat brown to bury my grief. I left because I was hungry. In my first writing classes, my professor told me the human condition was misery. I'm a river widened by misery, and the potency of my language is more than human. It's an Indian condition to be proud of survival, but reluctant to call it resilience. Resilience seems ascribed to a human conditioning in white people. They want us to bounce back. The Indian condition is my grandmother. She was a nursery teacher. There are stories that she brought children to our kitchen and gave them laxatives and then put newspaper on the ground. She squatted before them and made faces to illustrate how hard they should push. She dewormed children this way, that's what they say. And she learned that in residential school where parasites and nuns and priests contaminated generations of our people. Indians froze trying to run away and many starved. Indians, oh wait, nuns and priests ran out of places to put our bones, so they built us into the walls of new boarding schools. I can see my grandmother's face in front of those children, her hands real soft, eyes soft, round, like buttons. She liked carnations and canned milk. She transcended resilience and actualized what Indians were taught to know. We are immovable. Time seems measured by grief an anticipatory grief, but I know that she didn't measure time. And that's um, the opening chapter. And I just wanted to briefly speak. Um, the thing that gave me so much pause is every time I come across a line about um, nuns and priests ran out of places to put our bones, um, so they built us into the walls of new schools. It seems like horrific in a way that's like, unbelievable, but um, my grandmother went to St. George's school, and she always used to say that it was haunted, and there were students that never made it, and those bodies were buried in the school, and I think everyone should take their grandmother's stories as like 
primary evidence and primary sources because further research, even though I hadn't really believed her, further research proved like they did have children's like arms in the floorboards and things like that. And there's mass graves in most of these residential schools, so it's like the most horrific thing you can imagine happen, you know? Let's see. I don't have anything fun in this book. Like, <laughs> well, whatever. Um, let's see. This is about my dad. I'm going to read a, a couple of uh, paragraphs about him. Let's see. And I'll kind of jump around in the essay because I like the beginning and end. And sometimes I just like the middle, but right now I just like the beginning and the end. This is I Know I'll Go. My father died at the Thunderbird Hotel on Flood Hope Road. According to documents, he was beaten over a sex worker or a cigarette. I prefer the cigarette. I considered an Indian death myself while walking along the country roads of my reservation before I really considered life. His death intruded and I could not fathom being a good person when I came from such misery. I found newspaper clips about my dad. Ken and four men abducted a girl. There aren't any details. There are documents about his murder and the transitional housing program he was in when he died. He was homeless and social welfare gave him a hotel room next to sex workers and more violent men. There was nothing easy about his memory or what he left behind. He was an anomaly, a drunk savant. He took his colors, brushes, and stool when he left my mother. It was harvest, and the corn stalks were gold and waving. I was waiting outside on the porch. I ate blueberries and spit out anything too ripe, purple liquid. I remember staring at my spit on that porch. His hair was black and coarse. He was wearing a baseball t-shirt and jeans covered in rust acrylic. As an Indian woman, I resist the urge to bleed out on a page to impart the story of my drunken father. It was dangerous to be alone with him, as it was dangerous to forgive, as it was dangerous to say he was a monster. If he were a monster, that would make me part monster, part Indian. It is my politic to write the humanity in my characters and subvert the stereotypes. Is that my duty? But what part of him was subversion? And then this is like the end. His smell was not monstrous, nor the crooks of his body. The invasive thought that he died alone in a hotel room is too much. It is dangerous to think about him, as it was dangerous to have him as my father, as it is dangerous to mourn someone I fear becoming. I don't write this to put him to rest, but to resurrect him as a man when public record portrays him as a drunk, a monster, a transient. I wish I could have known him as a child in his newness. I want to see him with a sheet of perfection, with skin unscathed by his mistakes or his father's. It's in my nature to love him, but I can't love who he was. I can see him as a child. Before my mother died, I asked her if he had ever hurt me. I put you in double diapers. There's no way he hurt you. Did he hurt you? No, I said. If rock is permeable in water, I wonder what that makes me in all of this. There's a picture of my brother Ovi and me next to Dad's van. My chin is turned up, and at the bottom of my iris, there's brightness. My brother has his hand on his hip, and he looks protective, standing over me. I know without remembering clearly that my father took this picture and that we loved each other. And I don't think I can forgive myself for that compassion. Thank you.
hearing what you're writing about nowadays, um, because this seems to be like an older story. Um, what are you writing about now? Um, because this seems to be a story that you look back on now, as a person's changed. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm writing about, um, my best friend passed away September 30th of last year, and I'm not necessarily writing about that as much as I'm writing to her, because I think, you know, the impetus for that is that, like, when you have a real best friend, you're friends forever even if one of you dies. <laughs> and that's what I want, you know, a true friendship like that, where, like, I can still speak to her and function, you know? So I've been writing to her and also trying to, like, interrogate who she was beyond what I knew, which means, like, asking her mom, like, what kind of baby she was, which actually tells me everything I already knew about her. <laughs> So like doing stuff like that and also writing about murdered and missing indigenous women is is really important to me. Um, in the Mother Jones essay that you cited, I think like I wrote about a missing woman who I gave the name Roberta and it was it was her birthday yesterday. You know, so so like I'm almost thinking and writing about stuff like that. Other questions? Um, how did you find the like bravery to like write about such personal things and to like have everyone see so many intimate details of your life? I don't know. I feel like with like the intonation of my voice and stuff, I think you could tell I'm not brave. Like. Like, I'm actually quite awkward, and I don't like reading. So, you know, I wouldn't call it bravery. I would call it, like, when you invest so much in your art and you really care about what you're doing, you really, the natural, like, conclusion is you want to share it. Because you know that it will benefit other people in the room, and, like, I understand sometimes it's triggering, too. But, for example, like, when I read with, like, people who deal with generational trauma and cyclical violence and dysfunction, like, sometimes they're really empowered when I read. So, like, I think about that. I think about how little we hear women. How, like, how often do you hear a woman say, I don't like that? You know, you don't hear it as much as you hear women bearing things. So, I just think of those things before I go up and talk. Yeah, it's not bravery. It's like something else, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. No, it's really loud. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how to ask this, but the, the theme or topic or action of leaving comes up a lot in more than one way in your work. And so I'm just curious about like the space of leaving and its importance for symbolic power or real world power is leaving a big deal. Yeah, I think for me I was 16 when I went into foster care and it was on my own accord because a social worker had wanted to give me the opportunity to leave my mother's house. And, you know, ever since I was six, social workers have been sniffing around my mom and I and understood that something was going on. But when I was 16 I learned how to leave you know? And then I never stopped until I was like deep in my 20s. And I became so good at leaving people and things and not caring. Um, but then there comes a point in your life where like you ran away far enough where like leaving is dysfunctional. So like I am always thinking about how to stay. Because <laughs> that's like, it's, you know, it's the next challenge of my life. Yeah. And often what our problems are in real life is what your problem is going to be on the page. So like, if you're really impatient, your work is going to be hurried. <laughs> so like, if you're also like, you know, not self-effacing, your work is not going to be thinking critically about character dimensions and adding dynamism. Yeah, that's just another thing. One or two more? Anyone else? 
All right, Therese, thank you so much.